Okay, next up is uh, Juan Manfredi. He is at uh, Michigan State University in nuclear physics, looking to finish December-ish time frame, with the uh, ish part being typical for graduate students at his stage. Um, he did his practicum at Lawrence Livermore in uh, 2014 with Rob Hoffman and Peter Aninos. And uh, we've had talks on lasers and rocks, and now he's going to talk about really little stuff. Well, thank you for the introduction, and thank you all for your attention this morning. I do want to take a quick second before I start my talk to uh, acknowledge and thank SSGF and Crow and the NNSA. This fellowship has not only allowed me to do all of the work that I'm going to talk about today, but I felt the practicum experience, as well as the community of fellows that gets to meet every year, really enhanced my graduate experience, gave me breadth as a scientist, made me more well-rounded. So thank you very much. So I'm going to talk today about nuclear physics, a type of reaction called a transfer reaction on a chain of argon isotopes. I know that not a lot of people in the audience today are nuclear physicists, so I'm going to start from uh, the basics. So pretty much everything is made of atoms, OK? And inside of atoms, there's an atomic nucleus. It's this really small thing that carries most of the mass of the nucleus in the form of protons and neutrons. So we, as nuclear physicists, want to understand what this looks like. So the most straightforward, naive way to think about a nucleus is as some n-body problem with a bunch of nucleons. And now we want to try to calculate how each of these nucleons interacts with all the other ones, and then you know, do this ad infinitum. And when you try to do this, you realize very quickly it's impossible to actually write these equations. And computationally, it's extremely expensive. So in nuclear physics, what we can do is we can make an assumption that this n-body problem can be treated as n one-body problems. So we can average out the effects of all these pairs of nucleons to be like a mean field or a potential that only depends on the radius from the center of the nucleus. So here's the x-axis here. Oh, God. <laughs> here's the x-axis here. <laughs> and we have some uh, nice, well-behaved potential. This is a lot easier to deal with than all of these different nuclear nuclear interactions. And so, of course, at first glance, this looks like an extremely irresponsible assumption, right? Like, we're sweeping a lot of stuff under the rug here. But if we actually start to see the implications of this and put some, oh, and I also should mention that really most of the time we only care about the valence nucleons, or the most highest energy, so it's actually really less than an N one body problem. So if we actually start to put these nucleons into this mean field, we get these subshells, or single particle orbitals, that basically just depend on the angular momentum of, of, the, of the nucleon, so like 1s 1 half, 1f 7 halves. These are basically just ways of writing the quantum numbers of these nucleons. And so if we start filling in these single particle orbitals, and we start filling in groups of them called shells, we notice that at these special numbers that are called the magic numbers, 2, 8, 20, and then we can add a spin orbit force and get even more magic numbers, we predict extra stability. And the cool thing is if you look at the data, we see this in the binding energies of the actual, uh, of the actual nuclei. We see these magic numbers. So this independent particle model where we're treating each nucleon as existing in this mean field, independently of all the others, has some predictive power. Now, of course, like any model, to really understand it, you have to understand where and how it breaks down. So in particular, you can have correlations between individual nucleons that disrupt this mean field picture. So uh, how can we test this? I'm interested in a quantity called a spectroscopic factor. There's a mathematical definition up there, but really what I want you to think about it is as a way to quantize a single particle orbital. So what does that mean? This quantity can range from uh, 0 all the way up to 2j plus 1, or 1, depending on how you normalize. 2j plus 1 is just the maximum occupancy of an orbital with angular momentum j. It's just fully occupied. And if the spectroscopic factor is closer to that maximum value, that means this independent particle uh, mean field is a good approximation. It's a single particle-like behavior. Whereas if the spectroscopic factor is closer to zero, this picture breaks down. There's a strong influence of individual nucleon-nucleon correlations. And those of you that have taken quantum mechanics might look at this equation up here. And uh, it, you know, it's an amplitude. And then you're squaring it. It sort of looks like a probability. And I think that you can think about it that way. It's a probability that if you have some n-body nuclear state, and you pluck off a nucleon in state p, say, what's the probability that you're going to find 
a specific n minus 1 body state inside of that. And a simple example would be looking at the nucleus calcium-41 in the ground state at the f neutron orbital. The spectroscopic factor is 1. And what this means is that we can think about calcium-41 as being a calcium-40 inert core with a single neutron and an f7 halves orbital on top. And so this is a nice, pretty example uh, because calcium-40 has 20 protons and 20 neutrons. And like I showed you before, 20 is a magic number. So this is really the nicest possible scenario where we can, where we can do this study. But of course, it's usually more complicated. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about a way to probe this spectroscopic information, in particular, a reaction called a transfer reaction, and a type of transfer reaction called a PD reaction. What that means is that you have some uh, mass A accelerated beam, it's a nucleus, and you impinge it upon a proton target. And then all sorts of stuff can happen, but sometimes you get a neutron transfer, and this is, of course, a 100% accurate depiction of what that looks like. Um, and then if a transfer happens, you get coming out a deuteron, hydrogen 2, and an A minus 1 size, what, I call re what we call recoil nucleus. So basically, we're, we're plucking a neutron off of this guy and uh, getting a deuteron coming out and an A minus 1 recoil. This can help us probe the relevant single particle structures. Now, it's important to note that these SFs are not observables. You can't just set up a detector, count a bunch of deuterons, and then print out a spectroscopic factor. You have to extract these from data by comparison to nuclear reaction theory calculations. And I'll explain how that works in a moment. But I do want to mention that this technique has actually been used for a long time, using transfer reactions to study uh, spectroscopic factors. Uh, here I have a plot on the y-axis is uh, extracted experimental spectroscopic factors. And on the x-axis is those expected from nuclear structure calculations, some shell model calculations. And you can see there's reasonable agreement. Um, and now that there's all these new radioactive ion beam facilities, there's whole new swaths of the nuclear chart that we can explore with this technique that simply weren't possible to do before. So um, to actually extract a spectroscopic factor, you have to do a nuclear reaction calculation. So that's what this blue line is here for the case of argon-34, PD, argon-33. This blue line is a calculation in which you assume that the spectroscopic factor is unity. Okay, so this is a perfectly single particle picture, and we see that uh, we get some differential cross-section. That's our observable. It's a differential cross-section that depends on angle. Uh, when I talk about, you know, theta or, or angles, I'm talking about the angle of the emitted deuteron throughout this talk. So this is what the calculation looks like. Now we go out and measure a cross-section. And here's a set of fake data points um, where basically, okay, we see these data points and we get the right shape of the cross-section because that only depends on the exchanged angular momenta. Um, and there, the ratio between the data, the curve the data makes, and the calculation is close to 1. This is strong evidence that uh, this particular single particle orbital is being fully or almost fully occupied. Whereas if you had data that was the same shape but down here, this, if you take the ratio, you'd get some number that's less than 1. That's evidence that you have uh, nuclear nuclear correlations somehow disrupting this picture of the nucleus. So in principle, the transfer reaction is just one type of reaction probe. And you can use different type of reaction probes. And you should get the same answer. They should be consistent with each other. Now, of course, you can tell from the way I'm saying that that that's not what we see. Um, in particular, if you compare a transfer reaction to a knockout reaction, just another type of nuclear reaction, and see what the spectroscopic factors you get, you see some discrepancy. So there's a lot going on here, so I'd like to walk you through this plot. On the y-axis here is a quantity called the reduction factor. It's basically just a ratio of the experimental SF to the theoretically calculated SF. So in other words, it tells you how good is the shell model in this case. And on the x-axis is a proxy. Sorry, I aim this thing that way, and it points that way. Um, is a proxy for uh, nuclear asymmetry. So how neutron-rich or proton-rich a nucleus is. So on the left side, for instance, you see argon-46. That's 18 protons, 28 neutrons, relatively neutron-rich. Whereas if you move to the right, argon-34, argon-32, you have a much higher relative number of protons. And we're interested in studying behavior across this isotopic chain. So OK, there's actually two data sets here. The red corresponds to spectroscopic factors extracted from transfer measurements. 
and the blue from uh, data extracted from knockout measurements. So uh, the, the two experiments were run at different beam energies, um, the knockout at a much higher beam energy, and you can see that the, data, the, the, the two sets of data points are telling you very different things. And so to, to provide an analogy for really what this means, uh, if you think about, okay, two astronomers, okay, and they have two different types of telescopes, maybe one's like a gamma ray telescope or an infrared telescope, I don't know how it works, um, but two different telescopes, and they're trying to study the same celestial object. If they get radically different answers for what they're actually seeing, then someone's telescope is broken, or someone's telescope is perhaps not fully understood. Perhaps the gamma ray and the IR telescopes are probing information or uh, in a slightly different way or slightly different information. So we have to understand these probes in order to actually um, understand what we're measuring. And furthermore, if you actually look at the stories that each of these data sets tell, what the knockout data is saying, that is as you go to the proton rich side, the shell model is doing a much worse job. I mean, this reduction factor drops uh, or quenches, as we say in the literature, rather precipitously. Whereas the transfer data says that the shell model does OK across, or maybe a, a slightly worse at proton rich side, but it does OK across this isotopic chain. So there's both issues of nuclear structure and nuclear reactions here. Now, I mentioned that the two data sets were taken at different beam energies. So what we decided to do is to remeasure the transfer reaction data for these argon isotopes, but with the same beam energy as the knockout data. There might be some energy dependent effects in the potentials we use in our calculations, or maybe the assumptions we make when we do these reaction mechanisms, uh, they change with energy. We don't know. So we wanted to, to, to try it out. So I'm going to talk now a lot about my experimental setup. And the experiment was run at the National Superconducting Cyclotron Labor Laboratory, which is an NSF facility on the campus of Michigan State University. Uh, we have two cyclotrons here that accelerate stable nuclei from an ion source from a wide range of masses up to about 50% the speed of light. Then we impinge that onto a beryllium foil. All sorts of stuff can happen. We get a smorgasbord of different nuclei, some of which are exotic and interesting. Um, but we somehow have to pick out the ones that we care about. And for that, we use this fragment separator here. It's basically a series of dipole and quadrupole magnets that allow us to pick and choose individual isotopes that we want to study. Then this beam of, of, of now rare nuclei is transported to one of many different experimental areas. We do a lot of nuclear science here. I'm only going to talk about a very small slice of what happens. Um, and uh, I also want to mention that we're in the process now of a massive upgrade to the facility and a transition to becoming a DOE laboratory. In, a, in five years or so, the facility for rare isotope beams, or FRIB, will open. We're basically going to rip out these cyclotrons and put in a linear accelerator. And this is really the cutting edge of, of nuclear structure and nuclear reactions, um, is FRIB. So I, in particular, was concerned with this S800 spectrograph vault that I'm going to talk to you now in, in a lot more detail. I should also mention, for this experiment, the primary beams were uh, argon-36 and, cal and calcium-48, and then we used this fragmentation separation to get to argon-34 and argon-46, the isotopes that we're interested in. So this is a cartoon of the experimental apparatus that I actually worked on, and I'm going to walk you through it step by step. There's a bunch of different detectors, but first I'll give you an overview. We have the, the beam of argon coming from the cyclotron at 70 MeV per nucleon. And first, it's going to hit these green MCP detectors. These are basically for keeping track of the beam before it hits the target. Then we have the target, which we just want to target a proton, so it's just a piece of plastic. And then if a transfer reaction happens, coming out of that, we have a deuteron, which we detect using the high-resolution array, or HIRA. And then we have the heavy recoil, which is either argon-33 or argon-45. And this we detect with the S800 spectrograph. It's a three-story tall, 300-ton spectrometer that is used for a wide variety of, of different science at the NSCL. So I'm going to start with the microchannel plate, or MCP, detectors. This is what they look like down here. They basically just um, amplify electrons, just a couple of gain stages. Um, so we have this resistive layer anode down here. We actually put the MCPs sort of off the beam, these red lines here. The beam passes through a piece of aluminized mylar and excites electrons. Those electrons excite other electrons. We have an electric field between the mylar and the, uh, the resistive anode. So the electrons travel towards the MCPs. 
Then we have a permanent magnet that keeps them moving in nice little uh, coil trajectories so we get good resolution. And then we, we, we collect these electrons. So really what we're trying to do here, first of all, is uh, normalize our cross-section. So our observable is a differential cross-section. We need to know how many beam particles are actually coming in and hitting the target. That's literally crucial to doing this measurement. But we can also use these detectors to localize the reaction locus on the target. Where on this target is the transfer reaction actually happening? I mean, we care about the angle that the deuteron is coming out at. If you don't know where on the target your reaction is happening, that's going to really hurt your angular resolution. So um, the, the best way to show you how these work is showing the calibration data, I think. So we calibrate using a brass mask. We basically stick this mask with a bunch of holes in it in the beam line so the beam can only pass through these particular holes. And then after we do some calibrations and corrections, we see this nice calibrated mass spectrum um, where we see these different sizes of holes. And of course, we know exactly where those holes are so we can keep track of the beam um, for both of these MCPs. And if we know where the beam is for both of these MCPs, we just draw a line and we know where the beam is hitting the target. So now I'd like to talk about the S800 spectrometer. Like I said, it's this giant spectrometer we have. It basically consists of, of two dipole magnets here and then a box of detectors at the focal plane. Down here in this chamber is where the rest of the setup is. So this is where the MCPs are and the HIRA detector I'll discuss shortly. The beam comes from this side and then up in the, in the, in the, in the circle on the right, upper right of the, of the screen is the detectors that are sitting in the focal plane box. So we have uh, these gas detectors called CRDCs that are for keeping track of the position of the beam, position sensitive. We have an ionization chamber for keeping track of energy loss. And then we have a scintillator that we use for time of flight. So then we can use all these different quantities that we measure to identify the beam or the argon nucleus or whatever kind of nucleus is passing through the spectrometer. So if we try to do that right away, we compare the time of flight here on the x-axis and the energy loss on the y-axis. We see a bunch of sort of ugly looking bands. Uh, each of these corresponds to a different z but we don't care about Z, we care about individual isotopes. And the reason that this looks so crappy is that in the S800, uh, a single particle, depending on the angle it's scattered in, in the reaction, can take very different trajectories. And different trajectories means different energy loss deposited in the det detector, different time of flight. And so we have to do a bunch of empirical corrections, but after we do those, we get a very nice looking PID spectrum. All these individual blobs correspond to different isotopes. So then if we care about the argon-33, for instance, we just draw a gate around that and you know, we, we've significantly, significantly cleaned up our data set. So lastly, I want to talk about the high resolution array, which is again for detecting the deuterons. It's an array of silicon and cesium iodide charged particle detectors. Here's a picture of how it was arranged during the experiment. Although it's a modular detector, you can arrange it however you want, depending on your needs. And each of these metal boxes, or what we call telescopes, inside has several different radiation detectors. First, we have a thin silicon detector, 65 micron thick. With, it's segmented into 32 strips, so it's position sensitive. That's uh, what we call the delta E detector. Then behind that, we have a millimeter and a half thick double-sided silicon detector. So there's 32 strips on the front and then 32 strips on the back. So then the coincidence between two strips gives us a two by two millimeter square pixel where we know the particle passed through. This gives us excellent position resolution. Behind that, we have an array of cesium iodide scintillator crystals. And aside from having you know, good energy and good position resolution, the trick of HIRA is that we can get particle identification by comparing the energies within a different telescope. So comparing a relatively thin detector to a relatively thick detector. So I'll talk about what that means. Um, basically, if you imagine a particle that's going into this detector, it has enough energy to punch through that first delta E. And then maybe it has um, low enough energy that it's going to deposit all the rest of it into the E detector. So then what we can do is use the beta block equation, which is basically just an equation that tells you the relationship between the energy loss of a given particle in a given material, if you compare that to the total energy of that particle, that depends, that relationship depends on the mass number and the element of that particle. So we can now identify different charged particles passing through this detector. And so if we actually look at the, look at the data, here on the y-axis of this plot is the energy in the delta E silicon. 
And here on the x-axis is the energy in the E silicon. And we can see lines, these little banana shapes here. Uh, we see protons, deuterons, tritons, because that's what I care about. Higher can actually go, you know, higher Z to up to like oxygen. But if we have a particle that is energetic enough to punch through this E detector, then we can just do the same thing, but with these two detectors back here. So now the E is our thin detector, and the cesium iodide scintillator is our thick detector. And we make the same plot, and we see again these lines, P, D, T. And uh, you, know, you can see if you just look at the values on the axes here, this is, of course, uh, much higher energies because you're only dealing with the particles that actually punch through and make it all the way to the cesium iodide. So this gives us a nice, broad, dynamic range where we can not only detect uh, these particles but identify them as well. And this is important for this experiment because of this plot over here on the right. So this is a plot of, of some kinematic curves. There's no special physics here. This is literally just you know, applying conservation laws and seeing what you expect the relationship between the angle of the emitted deuteron in the lab and the energy of the emitted deuteron in the lab. So there's a bunch of different lines. Uh, it's sort of small. The red line is argon-46, and the blue line is argon-34. That's what's important here. And if we see these kinematic curves, um, and you compare that to the green line, which is the energy at which the deuteron will punch through the E detector. So it's the energy at which you switch from this particle ID to this particle ID. You see that line cuts right through the kinematic curves. So if we want to have uh, a nice wide angular range to study this, these transfer reactions, we really need both stages of PID. So now that I've shown you the, the HIRA data, I want to add in the S800 as another ingredient. If we gate on, for instance, the argon-45 and the S800, and then now we look at the HIRA data, so now we know that we have deuterons, we know that we have argon-45, this is the transfer reaction that we want. We can see some lines here that looks just like these kinematic curves, in particular the red kinematic curve. Um, there's multiple lines because there's excited states of argon-45. Uh, I want to point out that you can see that the, there's the, the two stages of PID. Um, as you go from the silicon to the cesium iodide, your resolution gets a lot worse. And you can really see that happening back here um, and when, once you get into the, the purple range. Um, we can compare this to the kinematic calculations. We get pretty good agreement. And uh, now I'd like to add in the, one more ingredient, which is the MCP detectors I talked about earlier. Like I said, we can reconstruct the target position, or the, the, the position on target that the reaction is happening. And we can see that the beam slide actually looks quite ugly. Um, and this is important because you know, we have these nice little pixels in Hira. It doesn't really make sense to have these tiny little pixels if your beam spot is so huge you don't really know where the deuteron is coming from. But fortunately, we can now use this information to track the position. And uh, if we compare the two kinematic curves, so on the left, this is the kinematic curve without using the MCP, and on the right is with the MCP, uh, you can see a definite increase in the resolution, especially as you move to more backward angles you know, up in this range. You can now very clearly identify the ground state once you use the MCP, so that's nice. Um, now we've added all these ingredients together. We can actually look uh, at the, using the deuteron energy, we can transfer to the center of mass frame, and then we can get the Q value of the reaction, and therefore the excitation energy of argon-45, and this is really what's gonna allow us to probe the single particle structure that we care about, this excitation spectrum. You can see, you know, this is an example of one narrow angular slice we basically take a whole bunch of narrow angular slices and create an angular distribution. And you can see we have a ground state, and we have some higher lying states as well that we can, that we can probe. And then we use the, the number of counts in these peaks to generate um, an angular distribution. This is the stage I'm at in my analysis now. I'm making these angular distributions. They look like this. I'm doing the theoretical reaction calculations to then you know, compare a plot. This is just one example to the reaction calculation and actually extract uh, spectroscopic factors. So I'm sort of in the stage of my analysis where I'm, I'm really wanting to compare to theoretical predictions. Uh, and this is for argon-46 uh, PD. So to summarize, I hope that I've convinced you that these spectroscopic factors are important for probing nuclear structure, and furthermore, that it's important how we study them and that we make sure we understand the probes we use to study them. Uh, an experiment was run at the National Superconducting Cyclotron Lab to look at both proton and neutron-rich argon isotopes. Analysis is ongoing, in particular theoretical calculations that will then allow for the extraction of this uh, SF of interest.
Um, lastly, I, I again want to acknowledge the fellowship. Um, my advisor, Betty Sang, and the rest of the, the group. This is some of us here um, next to some of the experimental equipment. And then uh, lastly, several other people who were really critical to running this experiment and helping me with the analysis, including the PI, Jenny Lee from Hong Kong, who actually invited me to work with her last summer in Hong Kong. Um, and with that, I'll happily take any questions. Thank you.